Let's open up in our Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 18, as we continue this series called Patriarchs. As we're right in the middle of the life of Abraham. Now, it's amazing when you, when you read the scriptures, God's word, and you see this happening in the life of Abraham. At this point, if you think about it, Abraham is well advanced in years. He's pushing 100 years old now. He's got a teenage son named Ishmael. God just gave him a sign of the covenant, which was the sign of circumcision, which was the cutting away uh, of the foreskin on a male genitalia. It's a strange sign. If you really think about it, we spent some time laughing about it last week, joking about it, but we also made the point last week that this idea of cutting away that which was unnecessary in the flesh was a, an important picture, wasn't it? Because we know that the true circumcision that God is looking for is not circumcision of the skin, but God is looking for the circumcision of the heart. That what God's design is in each one of our lives is through the ministry of His Holy Spirit to be doing what would be commonly called heart surgery, but not heart in regards to the blood pumping organ, but the heart, the seat of who you are. In, in biblical language, the heart is really the control center of your life. The heart is the place where all of the, the information that comes from your body, that comes from your emotion, that comes from your mind, where that spiritual part of you, the, that part of you that's eternal, all that information comes into your heart, the center of who you are. And decisions are made. And so, you know, in, in, in the Bible, the idea of heart, it's actually, it's the bowels. In Hebrew, they thought that the bowels, and we think of bowels as something different. They thought of the bowels as that deep part of where you are, where your essential personhood is found. In our conversations, if I say, hey, how's your bowels? You'll be like, hey, Pastor Daniel, take it easy. You know, it's a little too much information. But when I, if I ask you, hey, how's your heart doing? You're not going to say, well, you know, it's beating at 120 beats a minute. You know, I'm feeling pretty good. No, you're going to say, hey, I'm doing okay. See, so the idea is, is that what God is wanting to do in our lives is cut away, is to, is to remove the things that are in our hearts that are unnecessary, that keep us from being the people that God ordained us to be. So, but before God, by His Spirit, through believing in Jesus was to do that, He wanted to give a picture. And that picture is the sign of circumcision. And we ended last week with the reality that Abraham was 99, his son Ishmael was 13, and they had a circumcision party. Every single male got circumcised. And I, and I made a joke about that, but the reality is, is you've got to love the simple obedience of that. And the question for each one of us that I left us with last week is, if God is asking Abram, Abraham to do this thing and, and he just does it and God blesses him for it, what's pretty awesome is that God isn't asking any of you guys to be circumcised right now. So what is it that God is asking of you that you are unwilling to walk in in just simple childlike faith? You can imagine Abraham being like, well, you know, God, I think you're nuts. I'm not getting circumcised. I'm, a, I'm 99, you know. I don't bounce back as quickly as I used to. You could imagine him responding in that way. I mean, I would, you would respond. I would respond that way. But Abraham just said, okay, Lord, if this is, if this is your, it's your gig. Let's do what you say. And it's amazing how in the scriptures, obedience is such a, a seriously discussed content. It's always in there. Obedience. Now, as we move into chapter 18 today, now my original intention was to take chapter 18 and chapter 19 together this week. And as I studied, I'm quite sure that I'm not going to be able to do that this week. There's just too much in it. So I didn't want to rush over anything. So let's just jump right in. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, it says this, Then the Lord 
appeared to him, speaking of Abraham, at the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread and you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by. Inasmuch as you have come to your servant, they said, do as you have said. In verse 6, So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf, which he had prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Now, we begin in verse 1 with a simple statement that the Lord appeared to him by the terebin trees of Mamre. Now, you notice that Lord, right? It's in my, it's the third word of the very first verse. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is God's personal name. In, in Hebrew, it would just be four consonants. A yud, a he, a vuv, and a he. And those are Hebrew. We would normally say that that name is either Yahweh or they used to say it was Jehovah. So it says that the Lord appeared to him, right? I want to make sure that we get that right in the beginning because it's telling us who is visiting Abraham. Now notice it says, he appeared to him at the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent in the heat of the day. And so he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, three men were standing by him. So we get from the beginning, here in Genesis 18, that the Lord is appearing. Abram, Abraham is sitting in his tent where he was living at the terebinth trees of Mamre. And it's in the heat of the day. And he looks up and he sees three people. Now, notice the Lord appeared and now he's seeing three people. Now, I'm bringing all this up because what you have in Genesis chapter 18 and Genesis chapter 19 is one of the first incarnations where you have God showing up in a person's body. As we go on in Genesis 18 and 19, you're going to realize that one of these travelers, these people, is the Lord himself. And there's two angels who are going to go on to Sodom and Gomorrah. So I think it's important to, to, to make this case because it's so common, if, especially if you talk to someone who is of a Jewish background, when you start talking about Jesus being God incarnate, they'll always say, well, that's just not possible. It's just, how is it possible for God to come in the form of a human? I say, well, let's go look at Genesis chapter 18. Because even though they don't necessarily believe in the New Testament, I can show them from Genesis chapter 18 that the Lord shows up to Abraham, who is the patriarch, and shows up in bodily form. Okay, so I wanted to make sure we noticed that. Now, what's interesting about this is that this is happening at the heat of the day. Now, in, in Abraham's culture, in that region, you can imagine it's a desert, it's an arid climate, that there are certain times in the day that you just didn't travel. So Abraham was doing what was very common in that day, and that's resting at the heat of the day. So he's sitting there, he's resting in his tent, and he sees these three travelers who show up. And they're traveling at an inopportune time. Just not normal to travel at that time. So what does he do? I love this, in the middle of verse 2. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the ground. And he said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by on your servant. Please, let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring your morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. This is quite simply hospitality. Right here. These people are coming. It's the hottest point of the day. No doubt Abraham wanted to get his his siesta on, his rest on. It was the time to just relax. And these three guys come, and Abraham gets up, and he runs to them. Now, in that culture, 
well-to-do, powerful heads of families did not run. And it shows the difference between the way the average person was and the way somebody who is following after God functions. Abraham, very wealthy, very powerful, becoming very well known. He sees these people. He doesn't even know who they are. And he gets up and he runs to them. And all he wants to do is serve them. That's all he wants to do. I just did this in our staff meeting this week, talking about the spiritual discipline of service. Jesus said the greatest in his kingdom will be what? The servant of all. I told our staff, and I'm telling you guys right now, listen, serve first and ask questions later. It's such a simple thing, except it's hard to do, isn't it? It's so simple to say, I'm here to be a servant. But then when push comes to shove, in the moment, it's the heat of the day. I mean, it's so hot out. I don't want to do anything. When the opportunity arises, so often we neglect the opportunity. But would to God that us who call ourselves by the name of Jesus would have the servant's heart that Jesus had. Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In John chapter 13, Jesus took off his, his outer garment. He girded himself with a towel. He took a basin of water, and he did the most menial job, which was wash his disciples' feet. Richard Foster said Jesus took a towel and a basin of water, and he redefined greatness. And Abraham is a bright, shining example of what it means to be a servant of God. He runs to these guys. He bows himself to the ground before these guys. He says, he calls them Lord. He, he puts himself in a position of humility with his words and his actions. And he's like, listen, don't pass by. Let a little water be brought. Let us wash your feet. Now, in that day, these guys wore sandals. And in an arid climate, when you rolled in sandals, you guys ever hike in flip-flops before? Yeah, you know how that looks, right? You end up getting like, like a dirt line to about there. And so when, when he says, listen, let some water be brought. We're going to wash your feet. He's, th these weren't pretty feet. This was before pedicures. And definitely before pedicures for guys. <laughs> there was no metrosexuals in those days. You guys are like, metrosexual. You can look it up. You can look it up. <laughs> but a all Abraham wants to do is show hospitality. And, and we get from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. That's Hebrews 13, 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. And that's speaking about Genesis chapter 18. And would to God that we would go out of our way to serve people that we don't even know. That we don't even know. Now I know, I'm just going to let that sit. I'm not even going to qualify that. Because I know we're all qualifying it in our minds, right? What about this and this? Abraham didn't know who these guys were. He just wants to serve them. Now, I like this because he says, listen, I just want to serve you. We're going to feed you. We're going to wash your feet. You're going to take a break. You're going to refresh your hearts. And after that, you can go. And they say, sure, go for it. And then in verse 6, a Abraham gets his whole family springing into action. Notice this. Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly make ready three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. So he goes to his wife, Sarah, and he says, listen, here, let's make some, let's make some bread. Then Abram runs to the herd, and he takes a good calf. And he gives it to a young man, one of his servants, and he says, prepare it. And then Abram takes butter and milk and the calf which he prepared, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Now, know what I like about this? This is a great picture of how family's supposed to function. Because a family's meant to be a team. Now, Abraham didn't go in to Sarah and say, hey, let's make some bread. She's like, look, 
it's my time to watch a soap opera, honey. She didn't say, hey, listen, this is, this, is your, this is your gig. I don't know who those guys are. I don't want to be making any more bread. You know, come, come on. See, the Bible says that one drives back a thousand and two drives back 10,000. And there's nothing that Satan doesn't like more than a unified husband and a wife. There's nothing that Satan wants to thwart more than the unity between a husband and a wife. Because something powerful happens there. The picture of Jesus in the church. A husband and wife team that pray together, that serve the Lord together, that are just available to whatever it is that God wants to do. So he goes to Sarah, he makes some cakes. He goes out to the herd and he doesn't find like the most sickly looking calf that he can't wait to get rid of but he finds a good and tender calf. I love this because Abram just wants to give his best. He, he wants to give God his best and he's giving God his best by giving it to these people. And he gets one of his servants, like, listen, make this good. And not only that, he pulls out the butter, he pulls out the milk, he sets it before these guys and he lets them eat while he watches. This is like textbook Near Eastern hospitality right here. And it makes me think of 1 Peter 4, 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. And I don't know about you guys, but when I read that, I get pretty convicted. Because it's easy to be hospitable while grumbling, isn't it? It's easy to do the right thing and just be like, man, I really don't feel like doing this at all right now. But we get none of that from Abraham. Now, I always tell people, because people say, well, if, if you don't feel like doing it, should, I mean, should you really do it? And I always say, listen, you should do what you know you ought to do and ask God to bring your heart around. If we only, if we only do the things that feel right, we're never going to honor Jesus. So we need to be obedient to what God's Word says and say, God, I'm going to do this, but please bring my heart around. Will you help me, my heart, get behind what I know to be a godly action? Now, this is beautiful because this is all going on. Abraham, he's not even joining them. He is simply watching. He's just watching these guys eat. He's serving them. He's like, look, I'm not even going to share a table with you guys. I'm just going to enjoy you guys enjoying the blessing. That's what he's doing. And then all of a sudden in verse 9, then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, here in the tent, in verse 10. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him, in verse 11. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. In verse 12, therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure? my Lord being old also. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. So imagine this. These three guys are here. They don't know who they are. And all of a sudden, the Lord in a person's body says, hey, where's Sarah? And Abram says, hey, she's in the tent. And then we have a reiteration once again, once again, that she's going to have a child. Sarah, your wife, will have a son. This has been going on over and over and over again, hasn't it? Since Genesis 12. Once again, now many years have passed. Some 20-something years have passed, but now they're getting another word about God's promise of a son. Right? And then we, we're reminded in verse 11 that Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in years. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Now, is there anybody here who's in their 90s? Anybody? Any 90 year, almost 90 year old girls? 80s? 80s? Now, could you imagine if someone said, hey, you're going to have a child next year? You're just like, uh, you know, thank you, Lord, but maybe no thank you, right? I mean, I'll be honest with you. We're 36 and we're like, Lord, I don't know if we could do it again. 
you know? Because little kids are hard. It's work, you know? And so what you have going on here is you have this reminder that they're old. And I love verse 12. Because they're old, you get a therefore. And as we always say, what? When you see a therefore in the Bible, you say what? What's it there for? Because they're old and advanced here. Therefore, Sarah laughs within herself, saying, After I've grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? So she, Sarah's hearing this. She's listening in. Now, I got to be honest with you. Every time in the Bible we have a situation of eavesdropping, something goes wrong. Okay? Now, listen. I know, just like the rest of you, when you're hearing something that maybe isn't meant for you, there's always that curiosity. But really, eavesdropping is a sin. It really is. And it was funny because I was reading a tweet from one of the pastors of our church. He was talking about eavesdropping. I was like, I, I know what it's like when you catch a part of a conversation you're really not supposed to be listening to. I would encourage you that in the name of Jesus, just turn around and walk away. Every time you get eavesdropping, something ends up going slightly wrong. Something starts going wrong. So Sarah, she's listening in. She starts laughing. She's like, who is this guy kidding? Who's this guy kidding? I'm old. I'm old. This, is, this ain't happening. Verse 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? And you know what's beautiful about this verse? It's translated too hard, but the actual word in the Hebrew is, is there anything too wonderful for the Lord? And this is a question for each one of us right now, right where you are, whatever your issues are in life, whatever it is, that thing that God has you walking by faith on, a simple question, is there anything too wonderful for God? I'm here to tell you today that God can do anything. God's Word testifies of it. If you walk with Him for any length of time, you learn this. Is there anything too wonderful for God? Is there anything too hard for Him? Is there anything past what He could do? And we're going to see this played out in the life of a hopeless couple. A couple who for all these years, have not been able to have a child. Is there anything too hard, too wonderful for the Lord? Look what it says in verse 14. At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Verse 15. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Now, don't you love— See— Sarah laughed. She got busted. I didn't laugh. Notice it says because she was afraid. Can I give you a piece of biblical advice? When you're afraid, don't talk. I have learned in my life that when I am afraid, the things that fall out of my mouth will always get me in trouble. See, she laughs because she's afraid. And then she tries to pretend like she didn't laugh. And there's nothing worse than when you get called out by the Lord, by His Holy Spirit in your heart. And you're like, I didn't do that. And the Lord's like, oh, yeah, you did. Because that's exactly what, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a comical moment here. I did not laugh because she was afraid. No, but you did laugh. You know, as if God doesn't see what's going on in our lives. As if God doesn't know what is happening. Now, it's beautiful because in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, Sarah shows up by faith. This is Hebrews 11, 11. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. You know what the problem with walking by faith is? Is that you got to walk by faith. That's the problem with it. We live in a society that walks by sight. Like even, you know, because of the, the worldview that most of us have received growing up in the West in this time period, most of us base all of our beliefs on evidence, quote-unquote. 
the scientific method that we believe X because we have this data that points to it. Right? Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't walk based on evidence, but this mind, this evidentiary mindset, the scientific enlightenment mindset, if you read the writings of philosophers, they see the issues with it because the reality is, is that even if we see everything, that doesn't mean we interpret everything properly. You can have all the right data and interpret that data in a way that's wrong. This is, if you think about it in worldview language, the enlightenment was modernism. We can make a map out of everything. We can explain to you everything with data. And there was actually the belief that because we can do this, we are going to get all the answers and we're not going to need religion. There's going to be nothing wrong with the world. And that was the mindset. And now, a couple hundred years later, everyone says, well, listen, religion is just as popular, if not more popular now. We have all sorts of problems. And people are saying, you know what the problem with that way of looking at the world is? Is because it's assuming that the person making the map is totally objective. They are standing outside of the situation without any of themselves being put onto it. And the reality is, is that any good scientist will tell you that any of their findings are only 99.9% statistically significant because they can acknowledge that they don't know everything about everything. So when you read like The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, who's, who's one of the foremost angry atheists, because he's a PhD, we think he's got weight to what he's saying. But if you listen or read his book and you hear him debate, he'll say things like, if there is a God, I for one would be very disappointed. And I say to myself, that is lousy science. Because you're not saying I am open to the truth, whatever it may be. It's saying I am a PhD and I don't believe it. And if it was true, I'd be disappointed. And when you're disappointed at an outcome, you are going to be biased in your research. That's, that's basic logic. And post-modernity post is, listen, you want to make a map, but you have to include your own biases in your map making. Really, post-modernity preaches the fall to evidentiary theory. And for those of you who like this kind of stuff, it's, it's in there. See, the problem with walking by faith is that you got to walk by faith. And Sarah had no proof. There was no way, no evidence that this was possible. But she said, look, I know that he who promised is faithful. And she received the strength to conceive because she believed not in herself and not in the evidence before her, but she believed in the God who made the promise. And the reality, the reality of biblical faith is this is that if you believe that the God who promised is able to cleanse you from your mistakes, your sin, by putting your faith and trust in Jesus, and you believe that he, by believing in Jesus, can fill you from the inside with his spirit, and his spirit will cleanse you from the inside out, if you believe that, it will be a reality in your life. Not because it makes sense, but because God is able to do what he has said he can do. And this is why, for me, as an educated, someone who didn't grow up in this stuff, American man, I can say it makes no sense not to believe in Jesus. Not because I can prove it to you, but because God who has done this is in the process of doing this in my life. And if you walk and talk to somebody who's truly begun to walk with Jesus, you will see the evidence right before your very eyes. But the reality is, is each one of us have to walk by faith. And I'll be honest with you, it can be really hard. Because God is asking you to do something that feels illogical. How can I believe such a thing? How can I believe that God could really do this thing in my life? Transform my life. Transform my marriage. Take me from where I am and change the way that I am. How is it possible? Nothing else has worked. Sarah was strengthened because she believed that him who promised it was faithful. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you, God will be faithful in your life if you will trust him. He will be faithful. Now, from there in verse 16, 
It says this, Then the men rose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on their way. Now, this verse is very cool, and the rabbis make a lot of points about this because they would say that biblical hospitality means not only should you serve people, but you should finish that service well. And what they, they make the point that not only did Abraham do all this great service, but even walked them to the edge of his property. And I like that because I think for a lot of us, we begin well, but we end up killing the ending. I learned this as a jazz musician when I started learning how to play jazz. You know, I always heard, listen, if you start a solo well and you end a solo well, it's a good solo. And what that means is that if you start, you grab people in the beginning, and even if you have to meander for a little while, and if you end it powerfully, people will be like, yes. And it's so important for us. I realize that as we walk with Jesus together, that there's some of you right now who are doing great but you're going to get a little bit soft along the way. It's so easy to begin strong. But the Bible is a persevering faith. And we need to not only begin well, we need to end well. And I know for me as a, a younger pastor, and I've been in the pastoral ministry for 12 years, and I'm like, hey, it's been a great ride so far, but Lord, help me to finish well. Help me to keep on keeping on. Abraham serves them all. He, he's walking out with them. He's walking them to the edge of his property. Now I like this in verse 17 because it goes on. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know it. Now, what's pretty awesome here is that as they're leaving, the Lord is talking to these angels. He's saying, shall I fill Abraham in on what's going on? And this makes me think of Amos chapter 3, verse 7, which says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. See, Abraham was in a position for God to share with him what is going on. And I want to encourage you guys because God wants each one of us to be in that kind of a place where we are in such relationship with God. As Abraham was called later, he was called the friend of God in the book of Isaiah, chapter 41, verse 8. Your friends, the people who you are closest to, will bear the secrets of their hearts with you. And would to God that each one of us would be in such a relationship with God that God can tell you things that he wants to be shared. That's not a special thing for special people. That is available to all of us in Jesus' name. If we build that relationship. I get to know things about Lynn Fusco that nobody else gets to know because she's my wife. And we talk and I hear things in her heart. She hears things in my heart that nobody else gets. But she gets those things and I get those things. And that's true for our relationship with God. It's beautiful because... The Lord is talking. He's like, man, sh shall I fill Abraham in on what I'm up to? Because I'm going to bless him. He's going to be a great nation. And then in verse 19, one of my favorite verses, notice what he says about Abraham. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Now, I took this verse, actually, here at this church last year and did a whole message on this one verse. So I want to point you to it if you want to open up this one verse. Five purposes for the people of God right here in this one verse. So you can study that on your own. You can find it on our website. I'm, I'll leave you to do that as homework if you want. That's a pregnant verse right there. Powerful verse. But God is going to fill them in. Now, what's going on? Notice verse 20. This is why the angels are here. Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. Because their sin is very grave. I will go down now 
and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know it. The reason the Lord and these two angels are here is because they've heard about the grave sin of Sodom and Gomorrah and they want to find out, is it really so? They're there to see firsthand what is going on with Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, in verse 22, it says this, Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. So now, of the three, two angels go towards Sodom, and Abraham stays with the Lord. It says in verse 23, And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? In verse 24, Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And so the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy all the city for the lack of the five? And he said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. In verse 29, then he spoke to him yet again and said, suppose there should be 40 found there. So he said, I will not do it for the sake of the 40. And then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, indeed now, I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 20. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. But once more, suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. Now, what's this all about? This is all about Abraham acting as an intercessor for the righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham is functioning in a priestly fashion here. He is standing before God for other people. This makes me think of something like James chapter 5 verse 16. The effective fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. I really wanted to end our message today as we look at this act of Abraham and encourage you all to, to be intercessors. Intercessors are somebody who stands in the gap for other people. Most of our prayer lives, if we're really honest, are pretty self-focused, aren't they? And not that we shouldn't ask God for the things that we want, but truly, if we really have the heart of God, which is what prayer is all about, I always tell people, people say, I don't understand prayer. I'm like, well, prayer is not getting our will done in heaven. It's linking up hands with God to get his will done on earth. Abraham is not trying to convince God to do something that God doesn't want to do. Abraham is trying to ascertain and appropriate God's heart so that he can function. That's what he's trying to do. And the key to intercessory prayer says that Abraham drew near to God. So the act or the heart of intercessory prayer, it begins with someone who says, I want to draw near to God. I want to get close to God. Like the Apostle John in that upper room discourse where the, it says the Apostle John put his head on the bosom of the Lord, snuggling in to God. That's where intercession begins. And as Abraham draws near to the Lord, then he begins to ask the Lord what God is up to. And it really boils down, and he knows that God is there and potentially going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Abraham starts to ask him, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he says, Lord, if there's 50 righteous, would you do it? And the Lord said, no, if there's 50, I'd spare the city for the 50. And then 45, and then 40, and then 30, and then 20, all the way down to 10. Now, what's beautiful about this intercession is that 
Abraham's intercession is really a type of what I would call humble boldness. Abraham is not there saying, look, God, I just fed you. Now you owe me. Which is how a lot of us pray. We, we, we show up with an arrogance. We show up and say, I could say, Lord, I've been preaching your word for 13 years. Now give me this thing because I'm due. See, Abraham comes and he realizes, like, look, I'm but dust and ashes. I'm talking to the Lord. He keeps saying, Lord, who am I? What am I do? Who am I? Don't get mad, Lord. I'm not trying to impose my way on you, Lord. And I love it because Abraham has a true, humble boldness. And really, there's no other type of boldness that is godly other than a humble boldness. A boldness that says, I can come boldly to the throne of grace, but yet I realize that the only reason I have a seat at this table is because of what God has done for me in Jesus. In each human heart, there is a wellspring of arrogance. All of us. Now, some of our arrogance plays itself out in bravado. Some of it plays itself out in kind of self-deprecation or self-humiliation. Some of our our arrogance plays itself out in, a, in an elevated view of ourselves, and some of our arrogance plays itself out in a, in, a, in a really depreciated view of ourselves. But either way, the root is the same. It's just a matter of how it plays out in your life. And what I love about Abraham's intercession, not only does he have a bold humility, but Abraham's intercession is in accordance with God's character. He keeps appealing to God's justice and God's perfection. He's saying, Lord, won't the judge of the world do right? And he's like, Lord, if you judge and kill all the righteous with the ungodly, what are people going to say about you? Your character is this, and I'm asking you to function a long line with your character. When was the last time you prayed the attributes of God over somebody else's life? When was the last time you said, God, you are total profound love, and I want you to be that in so-and-so's life? When was the last time you said, God, you are totally merciful, and -and so-and-so, who I love, who I know you love even more, is totally, if you had a limit to your mercy, they have absolutely exceeded it. But God, I pray your mercy on their life. This is how to be an intercessor. You draw near... You stand in the gap before God and you ask God to be God in their life. To be who he has proved himself to be and to do it for somebody else. What I have learned is that when you start to be an intercessor, you don't even need to pray for yourself anymore because all of your joy gets tied up in what God is doing in other people's lives. And that is the most fulfilling thing in the world. That you, as you serve the world in Jesus' name before the throne of God, you get so overwhelmed with all that God is doing, you're like, man, I'm just happy. I mean, I got God. What else do I really need? And everything becomes in its proper place. Its proper place. Abraham is being like Jesus, who ever lives to make intercession for the saints. The Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. Abraham is linking up hands with the triune God to do God's will here on the earth. And next week, as we look at Genesis chapter 19, we're going to find out that there was only four righteous people in the city. And before God destroyed the city, he got those four out. God delivered before judgment. So next week... In Genesis chapter 19, we're going to look at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, especially in the day and age that we live in, there's all sorts of implications to this. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a serious chapter. So I want to encourage you to come. I know it's not the most um, light and fluffy of topics, but it is an important thing for us to understand. So I want to encourage you to come back next week. But for today, let's bow our hearts and pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word. 
God, I thank you for the testimony of Abraham and Sarah. I thank you for their willingness to, to just serve, to serve the people who, who came to visit, not even realizing that they were the Lord himself and some angels. God, we thank you that Abraham was close to you in such a way that you could tell Abraham things that you were up to so that Abraham could intercede on their behalf. Lord, we love the fact that Abraham didn't just try and take out his tool belt and fix it, but Abraham sought you. And God, I ask that you would make us not only servants who are hospitable, but God, make us intercessors. People who are all about your business. Seeking you, linking up hands with you to get your will done here on earth. We want to be vehicles that you could use. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and all of God's family said, Amen. Listen, before you...